Good evening and welcome to the Bard Graduate Center. I am so pleased to welcome you tonight uh, to our program, Historical Depictions of Information Technology in Popular Culture, with Professor Howard Besser, in conjunction with our exhibition, The Interface, Des the Interface Experience, 40 Years of Personal Computing. The Interface Experience tells the story of that past through tactile and interactive displays that stimulate new questions about how we interact with and use computers. The exhibition offers visitors a unique opportunity to gain a better understanding of the history of the design and material experience of computers. And it aims to stimulate personal questions about interaction with these devices and how they have influenced uh, each of our lives. Please pick up some additional information about our upcoming exhibition-related programs featuring walking tours, sketch nights, conversations, concerts, and film presentations. Professor Besser has, for more than 30 years, been involved with the application of cutting-edge technologies <clears throat> to retrieval, preservation, and examination of works of art. He is a scholar of digital preservation, digital libraries, and preservation of film and video. He is professor of cinema studies and the founding director of the NYU Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program, MIAP, a graduate program in the Tisch School. Uh, Howard Besser is a pro prolific writer and speaker has, and has consulted with scores of governments, educational institutions, and arts agencies on digital preservation matters. In addition to teaching uh, MIAP courses, he teaches a regular cinema studies course on new media, installation art, and the future of cinema. After the talk, if there is time, I encourage you to please visit our galleries located at 18 West 86th Street. The Interface Experience is located on the fourth floor. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Howard Besser tonight. Thanks, Melissa. Hold on. OK. Um, so um, tonight I'm going to talk about um, historic depictions of information technology and popular culture. Um, First, I'll start out, uh, off with um, the idea of looking backward. That's uh, from a, the title of a book by Edward Bellamy, um, which was um, uh, 19th century science fiction. But uh, we'll first start looking backward um, at previous technologies and how they're depicted and, and how that's uh, usually quite amusing. Uh, then I'll talk about popular culture as angst, um, essentially reflecting its own present. Uh, then I'll talk about popular culture as inspiration, um, which uh, is uh, essentially inventing the future. I'll talk a little bit about predictions that didn't come true, and then I'll look particularly at images of robots and automobiles and how those change um, over time uh, and what, what comes true and what doesn't. Uh, and finally, I'll talk a little bit about, about privacy and surveillance. Um, so when we look backward at past popular culture, it helps us see how different things are now. So for instance, we can look at uh, this computer screen that's um, uh, in, in charge of launch, launching nuclear weapons. Uh, it looks a bit primitive to us today. Um, we look at uh, what was then uh, thought of as cutting edge uh, workstations uh, in 1995, but they look pretty primitive to us. Um, we can look at the telephone or the Macintosh uh, behind Jerry Seinfeld, and uh, those look fairly ancient to us, and sometimes we giggle at how big these portable telephones were and how they had to have an antenna, telescoping antenna. Um, we look at our older screens. This is from You've Got Mail in uh, 1998. 
and uh, the screens look very primitive to us now, um, or uh, 1995, the net. Um, or we can look at video games uh, that took place not in our homes, but... So we don't ha really have arcades anymore, not like this, and our games look a little bit more sophisticated than those do. Um, or we can look back at um, kind of depictions of computer rooms, you know, these giant rooms. Uh, But some things don't change, like depict people who work on computers. Oh, no. depictions we see today pretty much um, uh, and then we can look again look back at older types of technology a big part of our lives. Um, so um, let me talk for a few, for a minute or so uh, about cinema studies as a field and how scholarship uh, from uh, uh, my field uh, tends to discuss how cinema genres reflect their own time periods. So we have scholarship over the Great Depression. This is Busby Berkeley's Gold Diggers of 1933. And this is a number called Worrying the Money. Uh, you know, I, I mean, you don't have to go very far in an analysis to see <laughs> that, uh, you know, popular films featuring things about people uh, 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 getting rich in the middle of the Great Depression uh, uh, and uh, what that means. Um, uh, Siegfried Krakauer. Um, uh, uh, made links between the kind of escapism of cinema, uh, particularly um, uh, German Expressionism, and the rise of totalitarianism um, uh, in his um, uh, fundamental book from Calgary to Hitler from 1947. Um, 
A lot has been written about film noir and post-war angst, um, the, uh, uh, the idea of the evil femme fatale uh, being a result of men returning from the war and finding that, that things weren't as rosy as they remembered. Um, this is from Double Indemnity, 1944. Or the 1950s, the McCarthy era paranoia that showed up uh, very um, vociferously in science fiction film, uh, uh, where people were always running from monsters or some other kind of hidden uh, uh, peril. Um, so, but the remainder of, of this talk, I'm going to focus on visions of the future. Um, uh, what we've seen so far is just kind of things that happened at their time. Um, most visions of the future are come from science fiction, come from um, things that are set in the future. Uh, and uh, are trying to, in some ways, predict the future or warn us about the future. Um, but not all things are that way. There are a lot of other popular cultures that are trying to envision the future in some way or other. Uh, so, for example, last year um, we had the, um, uh, the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of the World's Fair uh, out in Flushing. And that World's Fair was promoted as a vision of the future. World class anniversary. I haven't been in space in 50 years. The New York World's Fair. It is a celebration of a bygone past when everyone was thinking about the future. Thousands coming out to mark the 50th and 75th anniversary of the World's Fair at Flushing Meadows Corona Park, just as they did back in 1964 and 1939. I'm 61 years old now, and I'm back again to see it one more time before I die. <laughs> the park, a sea of memorabilia and memories. The famed New York State Pavilion, now designated a national treasure, open for the young and not so young anymore to see and remember. It's an amazing part of the New York's history. The designer of the famed 140-foot tall, 350-ton Unisphere, the late Gilmore Clark, remembered as well. His widow, Dolores, presented with a proclamation of achievement from the New York State Assembly in his honor. I'm so thrilled because dessert, Gil deserves every honor which he could receive. Back in 1964, the World's Fair drew 51 million visitors gazing at incredible new innovations like the world's first picture phone, which was on display today, and yes, somewhat less incredible. That might be alien technology. Back then, the World's Fair symbolized a time of optimism, a time of hope. It was shocking to see what was going to be in the future. And now, a piece of that past experienced once again by those who remember and those who won't soon forget. Scott Rappaport, CBS Q News. So, a vision of the future, optimism, hope, um, that's what the World's Fair was, was really uh, focused on. Um, and these types of things uh, are, are pretty openly ideological. They're not neutral. Um, so let, let's, let's look at um, uh, something made by General Motors in 1940, uh, picturing what the world would look like in 1960. So this is projecting out 20 years in the future. Oops. Sunshine is the city of 1960. Fresh air, fine green parkways, recreational and civic centers. Modern and efficient city planning, breathtaking architecture, each city block a complete unit in itself. Here is an important intersection in the great metropolis of 1960. Elevated sidewalks give a new measure of safe and convenience to pedestrians. So that there's more room for cars, this is General Motors. The available width for traffic in the street. And so, 
we see some suggestion of the things to come. A road which far from being finished is hardly yet begun. A world with a future in which all of us are tremendously interested. Because that is where we are going to spend the rest of our lives. In a future which can be whatever we propose to make it. I have to go through all the ways in which this is ideological, uh, you know, being uh, that the future will always be better. It will be better for workers. It will be better for General Motors. What's good for General Motors is good for the nation, as they used to say. Um, and uh, that we're all moving forward together and science and technology is moving forward in this uh, way of um, uh, improving life for everyone. Um, now, this 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 contrasts sharply with our uh, kind of dystopian views that come up uh, frequently in science fiction. But I'll get to those in a few minutes. Um, first, let me take uh, take us back to look at popular culture as being uh, an inspiration. In, 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 in fact, popular themes that show up in popular culture, particularly in science fiction, end up being the inspiration for other inventions later on, much later on. So we can say for the last 150 years that science fiction has inspired in, uh, invention. Uh, most people attribute both the submarine and the helicopter to the writings of Jules Verne. Um, uh, people attribute both the rocket and atomic power to the writings of H.G. Wells. Um, and both science and psychedelics are said to have inspired the, uh, the kind of growth in personal computers and, and uh, a... Um, um, uh, uh, bottom-up kind of approach to the internet uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. So we have, for example, uh, John Markoff's uh, uh, book about Silicon Valley from roughly 1960 to 1975, where he basically says, uh, uh, gives a huge amount of evidence as to uh, the influence of the counterculture um, uh, on the major figures of the time, you know, obviously Stuart Brand, who founded the Whole Earth Catalog, Doug Engelbart, um, the creator of Hypermedia, Steve Jobs, um, all inspired by elements of, of the counterculture. We can also look at um, uh, uh, inventions. Uh, the Smithsonian, um, uh, 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 not too long ago, did uh, a 
uh, a special uh, article on 10 inventions inspired by science fiction in the Smithsonian Magazine. Um, and um, so uh, just some quote, a quote out of there. Uh, Martin Cooper, the director of research and development of, at Motorola, credited the Star Trek communicator as his inspiration for the design of the first mobile phone in the early 1970s. Quote, that was not fan fantasy to us, Cooper said. That was an objective. Um, uh, also from that same Smithsonian uh, article uh, is how Star Trek inspired QuickTime. Uh, Apple scientist Steve Perlman says that he got the idea for the groundbreaking multimedia program QuickTime after watching an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, wherein one of the characters is listening to multiple music tracks on his computer. Uh, again from that article is the influence of Neil Stevenson's uh, novel Snow Crash on, uh, on Second Life. Um, Philip Rosedale, the inventor of the once popular online community Second Life, had been toying with the idea of virtual worlds since college, but credits Snow Crash for painting, quote, a compelling picture of what such a virtual world could look like in the near future, and I found that inspiring. Much older, we have comic books, right? Um, I, most of you aren't old enough to remember. Some, some of us are older, old enough to remember Dick Tracy and his communicator watch. To, it, it even said, in, in the comic strip, it would say, two-way wrist TV. Um, uh, but, you know, if, if anyone have an Apple watch? Not yet, see? Yet, the operant word yet. Um, but those things are coming on the market uh, like crazy right now if you look at the ads on television and other media. Um, uh, there's also um, uh, the idea of uh, exploring the hidden through enhancement. This is from Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner, version of Blade Runner. There's like way too many versions of Blade Runner. Enhance 224 and 176. So notice what the user interface is here. It's voice. It's talking to. So this business of being able to, to keep enhancing, repeatedly enhancing, and see something that's hidden in an image is, um, uh, I think, in some ways, the inspiration for the kind of latest uh, photo tools that are out now that allow you to uh, take a photo that's out of focus and put it back in focus. 
Uh, you can move around in the in the image because it has taken it at several different planes and from angles so that you can uh, actually put it back together. So that's that's kind of um, the inspiration. Um, we also have um, uh, works like uh, Vim Vendor's Until the End of the World from 1991, um, where he actually um, was given some prototypes for some type of inventions uh, that he put into the film and used in the film. But um, just take a look at the goggles that she's wearing. And... Um, Oh, somehow some of my images fell out. Um, uh, the, today's Oculus Rift, which uh, somehow I've lost the images here, uh, is a dead ringer for this. It's uh, uh, an exact copy. And uh, something has happened. I've lost, uh, I don't know, my, my images disappeared. Anyway, uh, trust me, the image, of the, the image of the Oculus, has anyone seen the Oculus Rift, which, is now, which was purchased by Facebook last year and is going to be a big product on the market? It's a dead ringer for this from 1991. And uh, it's, uh, it's being sold just to uh, known people right now, but uh, towards the end of this year, it'll go on the open market. Um, I also had a clip of online ordering pizza uh, from 1995, but uh, that seems to have disappeared as well. Um, um, okay, um, so there's some p predictions that didn't come true, at least not as envisioned. Uh, 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 in uh, the 1870s through the 1890s, Thomas Edison was promoting his telephonoscope. Uh, again, somehow the image has disappeared of that. Um, but uh, this was um, uh, a, um, uh, a device that would uh, let you, it, it was essentially a uh, picture phone uh, that never took off. Um, we also have uh, this uh, notion in the future that robots will take care of all things in our daily life. So uh, yeah, again, some of these images have disappeared, but um, here are some, I don't know why some are there and some have disappeared. Uh, but uh, we also have the picture phone from the uh, World's Fair. The one that I was, um, the one that didn't appear is uh, a photo of people working on a business problem together first via the picture phone. But uh, we also have people, uh, you know, the idea of keeping in touch with your family. Uh, and these things look 
you know, really strange now. But uh, to think that, um, you know, for, for 30 years after they were first introduced, no one bought them and no one used them. Uh, it, uh, you know, it wasn't till like roughly 30 years later that we uh, got some traction with the idea of seeing someone when you talk to them. But now it's quite commonplace. Uh, but there, uh, people had to wait in long lines to call. <laughs> you were calling up someone in the adjacent booth <laughs> at, at, at the World's Fair. So, um, you know, I guess it wasn't very practical um, uh, at, at that time. Um, so other things that didn't come true, uh, this is what uh, uh, a computer looked like in Star Trek uh, in the, tel the original television series in the 1960s. Um, and uh, in 2001 in Space Odyssey, it showed that the astronauts were eating TV dinners out of TV trays, which uh, didn't quite come to pass. Um, and uh, in war games, you have uh, basically a user interface that is text-based and all capital letters, and uh, no mouse, nothing, nothing like that. Um, in uh, Until the End of the World by vendors uh, 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 from uh, 1991, they were uh, anticip he was anticipating tele public telephones. Uh, the, the, the film is set, it was made in 1991, it's set in 1999, and he was expecting public telephones that look like this. Here's one over here, and here's another over here. Those never quite came to pass. We kind of skipped over the idea of having a video in a public phone. Um, let me talk uh, now talk some, about some specific kinds of things. First, robots and then cars. Um, with robots, we've gone from uh, the idea of robot as mechanical, as something from the machine age, as in Metropolis in uh, 1928, um, to today uh, uh, with, uh, what is it, Me Machina, ex machina, um, uh, where uh, it is a computer based form of humanity. This kind of transition happened over time, and um, uh, as part of it happening, again, my video clip isn't here. Uh, this was this, anyone remember the $6 million man and the bionic woman? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, th this was really the notion of the cyborg, which is kind of half mechanical. Uh, uh, it's part mechanical, part computer, and part human. So it's a, uh, it's a robot-human hybrid. Um, and uh, the, the idea that these kinds of things uh, could help with physical defects, the skin, they're still uh, both mechanical and computing uh, engines. And they really behave like computers. They have vision, uh, the vision of a computer that is constantly analyzing things as it, as it looks. Now, these types of things have, um, the, the, the computer vision uh, from that film has inspired other uh, inventions. So here's just from CNET um, about uh, scientists propose a cortical modem implant to give you Terminator vision. That's Terminator as in the Terminator. <laughs> um, uh, the um, uh, DARPA, the uh, Defense Department Research uh, Agency, uh, develops an implant with Terminator vision, plugs directly into a person's DNA and visual cortex. Uh, so we have um, all kinds of things like that. Um, we also have things like uh, her, uh, where you know, which is in some way reflective of and inspired by 
Siri uh, or Cortina or, you know, depending on what brand you use, your, your phone that talks to you. Um, in, uh, in Blade Runner in 1982, um, they actually, um, uh, Ridley Scott in the, in the film proposed uh, what I would call a Turing test for robots. It's a, 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 a Turing test is a test um, uh, developed by uh, Alan Turing, who was the subject of a recent film. What was the name of the film? Imitation game. Um, uh, but um, he proposed this test to see whether, if, if you could pose questions to a computer, uh, uh, if you posed a number of these questions and you were in another room and it, was, it, it answered you, would, you, could be, you would be able to tell whether it is a human answering you or a computer. And so uh, Blade Runner has you know, exactly that. Um, uh, with this, uh, this kind of touring test. Uh, Here's a magazine. Come across a full-page photo of a girl. Is this testing whether I'm a replicant or a lesbian, Mr. Deckard? Just answer the questions, please. You show it to your husband. He likes it so much he hangs it on your bedroom wall. <laughs> I wouldn't let him. You're watching a stage play. A banquet is in progress. The guests are enjoying an appetizer of raw oysters. The entree consists of boiled duck. Would you step out a few moments, Rachel? So, memory implants, which come up later in other types of movies, uh, um, uh, and uh, even prior to this in science fiction. Um, but this, this whole notion of is, is it a robot or isn't it, does it even know that it is a robot? And in the end, Harrison Ford goes off with her anyway, uh, even though he knows she's, she's a robot. Um, now, some of the kind of subtler predictions uh, around robots are actually quite accurate. So uh, let's look, look at and listen to this. And uh, it's talking about things like robots, but it's really, uh, really referring to computers. This is from 1940. And uh, you'll see a lot of things that are uh, really recognizing way ahead of its time. Whoops. Roll on the robot. The chromium plated butler is just a daydream after all. But not so Rolo's little brother and sister robots. The millions of small mechanical servants that never ask for afternoons off. The amazing machines and gadgets that almost seem to think for themselves. The tiny clockwork brains and heat regulators on our kitchen stoves apparently do almost everything except read the cookbook. 
Thinking machines like this keep golden brown slices of toast from turning into slabs of charcoal and keep the coffee hot until we're ready to start dunking. Then there's a tea kettle that's been trained never to boil dry. When the water is gone, the kettle simply pulls out its own attachment plug. And here's a gadget that ought to raid a bow from every dog in the country. A Fido feeder that never forgets when the pup is dining home alone and the rest of the family is dining out. I don't What's see why that never took off. <laughs> in offices and school rooms, too, robots have learned to turn on the lights. This little electric eye measures the amount of daylight coming in the windows. When the light level outside drops below the requirement for good visibility, this robot throws a switch and the first bank of lights goes on. No robot machine has ever been accused of being absent-minded or careless at its work. Here, a robot that never <coughs> speaks nor winks nor looks out the window stands guard over the men who work at this giant press. As long as the robot can see the man, the press won't budge an inch, and that's mighty important on a big job like this. Did you ever hear of anyone getting his lap caught in an elevator door? That can't happen here, because as long as there's anything in the way, this door can't close. <laughs> step back, please. There's plenty of room in the rear of the car. All right, then, don't step back. Just take a deep breath and hang on to yourself. One little robot, for example, always remembers to serve drinks when it sees anyone walking around with a thirst. A beam of light is aimed across the fountain and into an electric eye. When the beam of light is broken by a solid object, such as this head, the electric eye is broken <laughs> the and there's your drink. This particular device is an automatic fire sprinkler. Someday, maybe someone will invent a robot that can take a joke. Some robots have even learned to fly. Tiny automatic brains in giant airliners, sensitive to the slightest change in balance or direction, relieve the busy pilots of the job of keeping the wings level, the nose on the horizon, and the plane headed in the right direction. Don't look now, but this motor car is simply full of robots. In the carburetor is a diet specialist. A brainy collection of jets and valves and floats that serve a health menu of gasoline. Okay. So, uh, I mean, this is pretty, for 1940, predicting all of these kinds of things that were, these are things that were just starting to happen, but now, I mean, Anyone have carburetors anymore? Or any parts in your automobile that you can change yourself? They're not mechanical anymore, but they still are robots if we assume that uh, a computer is a form of robot. And, um, but, you know, again, full of, you know, this will uh, fix all the labor problems and things like that, so. Um, so let's talk a little bit about automobiles now. Um, uh, here is, again, from a 1940 General Motors. section of 1960's Express Motorway. Along the ledge of this beautiful precipice, traffic moves at unreduced rates of speed. Safe distance between cars is maintained by automatic radio control. Curved sides assist the driver in keeping his car within the proper lane under all circumstances. The keynote of this motorway, safety. Safety with increased speed. This 1960 drama of transportation progress is but a symbol of future progress in every activity made possible by constant striving toward new and better horizons. You know, again, the ideology around it, but, um, um, but this, is, this is 1940 anticipating that by 1960 we'll have uh, roads that are like this, which, of course, we don't. Um, uh, there, 
there's this much longer piece on uh, robots and cars from Leave It to Rolo, but I'm, I'm not going to go through that now. Um, we have automobiles with a personality. Anyone remember the film Christine by John Carpenter? The uh, car with it... Uh, uh, has uh, a mind of its own, so to speak. Um, we have uh, Night Rider, the television show, where you have a car with artificial intelligence. That doesn't mean that the person driving it has all that much intelligence, <laughs> but uh, with David Hasselhoff. Um, but on the road today, we have these autonomous driving cars uh, brought to us by Google. Uh, and uh, they're trying to get permits to let these things drive uh, all over the country. Um, so the last uh, area I want to cover is privacy and surveillance. Um, we can go back to the 1956 film titled 1984 after uh, George Orwell's book. Uh, where, where we're under constant surveillance or, um, you know, if you uh, uh, take the, the principle of the panopticon, uh, as long as you think you're under surveillance, you will act as if you are under surveillance. Um, in that same film, we have torture, the kind of torture uh, we've uh, seen in Abu, Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. Um, we have uh, the kind of mass rallies and, and uh, lockstep kind of uh, uh, adherence to an ideology. Uh, and uh, the, particularly this and this uh, have led, uh, kind of inspired this. This was a commercial that aired once at the Super Bowl in 1984. Again, this kind of comes back to the, you know, the kind of self-image of people in Silicon Valley as being um, highly protective of certain values, counterculture values, uh, including a kind of anti-totalitarian value. Now, <laughs> as far as privacy goes, you can't really, uh, <laughs> it, it would be hard to accuse uh, Silicon Valley today of being uh, particularly protect protective of privacy, except that they they still think they are. They think they're protective of privacy against the government, but not against commercial operators or advertisers, or at least many of them do. The ones that aren't cooperating with the NSA. Um, the um, we also have, uh, this is from 2001 Space Odyssey from 19, uh, 1968, uh, where we have um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, trying to gain independence.
Where the hell did you get that idea out? <laughs> very thorough precautions in the park to test my hearing aid. I could see your lips move. Okay. So <laughs> the uh, self-aware computer and in the dystopian view, uh, the computer uh, is self-protective and wants to do away with the humans. Um, also in this kind of nexus of uh, privacy and surveillance, uh, we have um, uh, Francis Coppola's uh, film from 1974, uh, The Conversation, um, uh, where uh, Gene Hackman is this uh, person who totally invades everyone's privacy. But you know, for 1974, th this is from the opening credits of uh, The Conversation. For from 1974 to have, you know, all of these surveillance cameras up on the screen showing all these different scenes, that's um, pretty much anticipating our world today. Um, uh, I'm not going to show you. This is um, uh, from the 1984 version of 1984. Um, uh, with uh, surveillance uh, kind of questions, but I will show you a brief clip from Brazil, 1985. So this view of the future where there's so much paper The machines are these strange kind of old looking that this is it's similar in 1984 in the 1984 version of the film So a, a kind of a looking forward, but also kind of looking backward. Um, we have the 1998 film, Enemy of the State, um, uh, where there are, there's an incredible amount of surveillance, uh, again, anticipating the world of today. Uh, and the surveillance is coupled with computing technology to uh, do facial recognition, things like that. And um, uh, in 1995, we have the film uh, The Net, which um, takes kind of paranoia to its height. We all live in the age of information. We're sitting on the most perfect beach in the world. All we can think about is where we're going to put my mind. Every trace of our existence is computerized. Everything about us is encoded somewhere on a complex network of information. Computers your life, aren't they? Yes. Perfect hiding place. Computer analyst Angela Bennett was just doing her job. When she stumbled onto something What's this? she never should have seen. I put it in and I'm staring at the personal medical files of the Undersecretary of Defense, Michael Bergstrom. Someone's connected to the system. How long would it take to track it? Depends on how long she stays alive. Something. Why would anybody want to do any of this? That reaches farther than she could ever imagine. They hacked into computers and they caused this chaos. Wall Street. The market panic has official suspended trading. The Department of Water Power in Atlanta. Elliot. We've lost radar contact. Now, from the gun. They are not a game of worlds. You can make it reality, what we choose. According to the Department of Motor Vehicles, you're with Mars. They, they, they've recruited my information and my fingerprints. I don't understand why me. Infiltrating her life 
So this, so, so this uh, this ability to uh, totally screw with someone's life and uh, uh, and uh, to be able to find all of these details about their lives and to erase them uh, seemed quite far fetched to most people in 1995. But you know, today it doesn't seem quite so far fetched. An alternative Christmas message from NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden, who of course revealed the extent of mass government surveillance programs in the US, the UK, and other Western countries. And he was speaking all about privacy. He said that George Orwell's 1984 was a real fairy tale compared to the reality that we're living with right now. A child born today will grow up with no conception of privacy at all. They'll never know what it means to have a private moment for themselves and unrecorded, unanalyzed thought. Talk to Jim Kellogg, executive director of the Open Rise Group, and he told us that if societies remain docile, there will be nothing to stop the rise of surveillance states. If we don't think about the consequences of that and ask ourselves how we limit the power of the state in the face of this change that digital technology brings, then we are going to you know, move into a surveillance society just by default. Of course governments are going to use spies, of course they're going to surveil people from time to time. But what we found out from Edward Snowden is that they've changed for what they do. You know, 20, 30 years ago, they would have targeted a few individuals. They wouldn't have been trying to surveil the whole population. Uh, not unless you were, you know, East Germany or something like that. But what we know now is that that's what they're doing. They're just gathering information on everybody indiscriminately. Of course, we're not going to stop governments from spying on each other, but that is a very, very different matter than, than using the excuse of terrorism to keep tabs on everybody. Okay, so the last uh, uh, set of slides I'm going to show you before we uh, break uh, is on user interfaces. and. Um, and how these um, uh, user interfaces uh, have, uh, uh, images of them have changed over time. This is from the Twilight Zone, um, um, uh, uh, a television episode on the Twilight Zone from 1964. I have stated the problem. State magnitude of radiative correction. Answer, please. Important question. Stick to the subject. <laughs> so notice how the uh, the user interface is like out of Jeopardy. Or something. <laughs> um, but um, this is kind. Of, this is kind of interesting. Uh, is anyone familiar with this episode? The, the, the computer gives the computer nerd love lessons, um, uh, but he purposely misleads him because the computer is jealous. So that's what it turns out. The computer's name is Agnes. Um, but we, we also have these um, uh, from War Games. Uh, again, uh, kind of uh, line-based uh, computer interface. Um, we have, uh, from Star Trek, we have speech. Ready. <laughs> computer, this is a Look class A compulsory directive. <laughs> Compute to the last digit the value of pi. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. 
as we know, the value of pi is a transcendental figure without resolution. <laughs> the computer banks will work on this problem to the exclusion of all else until we order it to stop. Yeah, I'll just keep that thing busy for a while. So, <laughs> speaking to the computer, which now we can do a little bit with Siri and Cortina, uh, we also have uh, kind of gestures for a user interface. This is from Minority Report. Contact search for future victim Rio Crow. Witnesses ready to preview and validate number 1109. Ready when you are, John. Standing by. Oh, I love this part. I've got no address, last known or otherwise. No tax returns for the last five years. To get the ICP's kind of thing. Looks like federal housing, concrete, glass, egg crate. So, okay. so we're, we see an interface like this now in Hawaii Hawaii Five O and uh, uh, NCIS, uh, uh, CSI. Uh, these various shows have the ability to kind of wave and swipe to do a user interface. Um, and some products are starting to be able to do this. And here's here's Hawaii Five O, just kind of pushing these things onto a screen. But you know, the idea of they're kind of sliding things over. But the idea of swiping as a user interface was unknown 15 years ago, and and looked very strange. So um, just a couple more uh, on um, uh, the kind of com uh, other interfaces. Here's computer vision interface. This is from the original Terminator from 1984 when he first gets to L.A. He's computing as, you know, the, the kind of facial recognition and analysis that happens constantly. Uh, and we have um, a, a, a virtual reality user interface in Johnny Mnemonic from 1995. Password enter. Welcome to BRT Online. Global net selected. What are you doing? Making a long-distance phone call. <laughs> a lot to make a long-distance phone call. <laughs> um, but again, it, you know, we, we see that in Oculus, which we'll look at in a second. But um, uh, and then um, the the uh, from Star Trek uh, Next Generation, we have the holodeck, which puts you puts people in a totally different environment. This is what it looks like before the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, um, surface map is put on it. Um, but these are the kinds of things that we have with, with Oculus. Here's the Oculus uh, goggles, which look very similar to the ones in, uh, 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 in the end of the world. Um, so uh, to kind of... Um, end up, uh, it's just, just an hour now. Um, some utopian visions of the future are just around the corner, like the Oculus. Uh, some dystopian ones have already arrived, mm -hmm. the PRISM project of the NSA. Um, and some may or may not come true. One last clip, short clip from uh, uh, Until the End of the World. Whoops. My computer's wiped. Mine too. All electromagnetic circuits get wiped by a nuclear blast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and, and there you also have some of the angst that runs through some of the dystopian ones where the threat of uh, some type of nuclear blast. But that would pretty much destroy uh, everything. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's the talk. Uh, the slides, including the missing ones, are uh, at that URL. And here's some of the me with, with all the DVDs and VHS tapes that I had to look through to put this together. So thank you. So questions, comments, discussion? I have a question about the Rolo film. Mm -hmm. Was that a film or is it kind yeah. of like a newsreel? Or what? No, it was an industrial film uh, made by the Jam Handy Corporation. Uh, let me... Uh, I don't... Do I have the notes? I'm not sure. It was, uh, it, it was called Leave It oh, to okay. Rolo. Um, uh, it's made by the Jam Handy uh, Corporation. Um, Jam Handy was a company uh, out of uh, Detroit, Michigan that made a lot of promotional films for the corporate world. Um, so this was likely made for some association of um, uh, 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 home improvement, kitchen, appliance, uh, kind of things. Um, uh, uh, Jam Handy uh, also made the, the General Motors uh, future right. one as well. I want, yeah, because I've seen, like, um, because it's 1940, that if it had any relation to the World's Fairs, which, which you know, the West Coast or the East Coast. No, no, not, uh, no I don't believe so, situation. no. Because I've seen a film, like, there's a great film, which is called something like, the Middletons or something go to the World's Fair, yeah. and they show Westinghouse's oh yeah 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 yeah, like that. yeah that was that was like yeah. 1939. But this is much yeah. more you know futuristic. Yeah, whereas yeah. that was really showing products that, was showing that were things that were coming out of the next right. year or so. <laughs> just about to get onto the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this was this was trying to be really pretty mm -hmm. far in advance, you know, the idea of a robot. Yes. Uh -huh. um, it, but, but it also was trying to illustrate um, the kind of uh, uh, things in our daily life that have these switches and, and mechanisms that, that at that point were all uh, mechanical and now, you know, I don't know about you, but my, all all the all the buildings I work at in, in NYU, the lights go on and go off when I go in or out of the room, and uh, you know there's sensors everywhere for things like that, uh, and they they show how that was working in the mechanical age with the lights going up and down and, mm -hmm. and things like that. But they you know these things are pretty commonplace now, um, but that you know for 1940 to be talking about that, I think that's pretty pretty advanced. And I want to thank you for giving me an entrepreneurial idea for the dog feeder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really wonder why that never caught on. It's a we should sell it to that company that now does just the um, thermostat. Whatever that's called. <laughs> the nest. Yeah. Nest. <laughs> yeah. See what I told you, the dog feeder. Other? Yeah. John. When you're showing the clip of Brazil, um, I was thinking about how like it's not just a vision of the future, but it's also a commentary on like previous visions of the futures. I mean, it's kind of like a riff on Metropolis. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was wondering if you think that that kind of starts in the '80s, where things start becoming more like self-reflexive. Well, well, first of all, Brazil is is a riff on Metropolis. It's also a riff on 1984, which came out a year before it. Right. And you know, they're, they're, they both have these very similar looks, where their their portrayal of the future looks in some ways futuristic, but in some ways looks old, looks very old, and looks very old fashioned. And in both cases, they they really are commentaries on uh, on the um, um, kind of history of these uh, 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 these uh, um, 
of, of other films and other cinema uh, and of the role of, uh, of the average individual, you know, be it a worker, you know, a, a worker in an office, a paper office. You know, I, I mean, I, I can't help but think that Brazil was um, a very heavy commentary on what was happening in terms of office automation at that time. That was, that was really kind of the high point. Um, uh, uh, some, some friends of mine had started this uh, magazine in 1982 called Process World, which was the disgruntled office computer workers uh, um, uh, magazine. Um, and, you know, Brazil was really, I think, uh, very much a reaction to the rapid uh, amount of word processing that was hitting at that point in time. I mean, think, think about it. Uh, Brazil came out in 1985. Um, uh, 1981, uh, the IBM PC came out. You started having rapid uh, uh, automation of office spaces, uh, word processing, and, uh, you know, as uh, our, the magazine Process World put it, new forms of wage slavery, um, uh, even more alienating than before. And, uh, you know, I certainly when I saw Brazil, it spoke to me at that point in time as really addressing that that moment in time, um, and you know, just just this one scene with all of that paper and people rushing around until the boss goes away, and then they turn on the television sets. You know, it's been a very I can't help but read that as a commentary on on, on that time. Yeah. When I saw those same clips, I had um, had a thought that there was a. They were a little bit of a precursor to Gibson's The Difference Engine and the concept of steampunk, yeah. which has shown up, for instance, in yeah. the Avengers, uh, Captain America. Sure. Yeah, this blending of old-fashioned Victorian technology yeah. with contemporary yeah. stuff, and it's it's interesting yeah. blend. No, absolutely, and I think I think both both 1984 and Brazil, which were just a year apart, yeah. do that. They're really uh, embedded in in that kind of. Uh, uh, approach that later became really hip. And yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, most depictions of robots and artificial intelligence are anthropomorphic, but you had two examples in the presentation that weren't, and they're both really famous examples of her in 2001 in Space Odyssey, disembodied uh, artificial intelligences. So why do you think a filmmaker would choose an anthropomorphic uh, robot over a non anthropomorphic one, and what 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 do those two different portrayals say about how we think about artificial intelligence? Well, I think we're much more likely today to have a non anthropomorphic approach to a robot than we would have throughout any time in history. I, I think 2001 is an exception um, um, because you know now we're starting to see you know uh, we're, we're talking to our phones I'm not talking to someone at the other end we're talking to the phone right and so so we're, we're starting to see the phone as being you know something somewhat human or having some type of intelligence. It can understand our language and there, it doesn't look like a human. There's no form or shape to it. Uh, I mean, it actually, we can hold it in our hand. Uh, I mean, there is some form to it, but it's not a humanoid form. And so I think, you know, her is uh, the first of what will be, I think, a, a, a slew of these things where the, the robot or the android or the artificial intelligence in the future, it's going to be hard to look at it as something that looks human. Because we're, you know, a lot of when someone is writing science fiction or when someone is, uh, particularly when one's trying to depict it on the screen, 
it has to resonate with people. And um, uh, a, uh, a, something that doesn't have a body has never really, in the past, hasn't resonated with people very much. And now it, now it can because people are used to talking to something that doesn't have a body shape. But, you know, it will be, I think it'll be somewhat a, a break to actually, uh, I mean, I would, I would assume that we'll see things that are shaped like this, you know, and then we'll start to see things, and it'll gradually drop any form at all. Um, that's, that's my guess. But, the, but all of these things, it's, it, it always, it has to do with what, People will accept, and the idea. I mean, people, in a lot of ways, a, a, an anthropomorphic robot is the ultimate interface. Is where we, we understand how to communicate with other human beings. So we could understand that would be the ultimate way to, to interface with the computer, because we've been doing that for right. millions of years. It's funny because in that Rolo uh, film, she tries to talk to it, right? And <laughs> that's the natural thing to do. It's like, oh, I talk right. to this thing, and then she has to push the button because it's right. forty, and you push buttons. That's and right. That's right, and um, I mean you you can look look at look at the f films in the fifties. You know when you have uh, 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 what's the film uh, where the robot the giant robot comes down in a spaceship. The day the earth stood still. The day the earth, day the, the day the earth <laughs> stood, stood still. You know again it's the the question is what language do we speak to this. Klaatu, what, whatever he says to him, uh, you know, it's it's you know, but it is it it does communicate with language. It picks things up with its arms. It, you know, it it, it does it because that's much easier for us to relate to than some kind of spirit or something that's not very embodied. And you know, I think we've had. I can't I can't put my finger on it immediately, but I, I I do think we've had some films that have failed with audiences because the computer has been too disembodied. It's been a you know a voice or a, some kind of abstraction or a, um, uh, it, it just hasn't hasn't resonated with people. But I, I can't think of an example right now. I think it's quite interesting that we still see like the robots and us as kind of different things. Like I see more like my phone and then you see like the the Google watch and the glasses. Like I feel like we're the ones that are kind of becoming more the robots. Like it's kind of merging a little bit more. And I haven't seen that many well, I haven't seen any films actually that kind of where the person that he becomes the robot, and I feel like that's kind of more. There's an interesting one in video games called Existence. I don't know if anybody here has seen that Cronenberg film, but where basically it's a video game controller and system that is oh, made up of yeah, yeah, it's made up of biological parts, and that's becomes part of you, and, you do this and then it just oh, grows up. Yeah. That's very Cronenberg. Yeah. <laughs> you see, that's where the six million dollar man could have gone if yeah. they had thought back then they yeah. were just focused on the toys. Right. But he could have become more. Right. Yeah. Well, you mentioned all the different versions of Blade Runner. If you don't watch the original version and the director's in the final cut, there's an interpretation that comes out where Harrison Ford might be yes. a rep. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And that's such a great, one of the great things about Blade Runner, I think, is talk about the Turing test, once the computer passes the Turing test, there's no way for you to tell whether or not you're a robot other than cracking your skull on the sidewalk and, and taking a look. Because there's no test that you can give to ensure whether or not someone standing next to you is a robot or not. So you don't know whether or not you're a robot. Um, so you got to watch the final of the director's cut to get that interpretation. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I was I was going to say that as well. Um, so, so Harrison Ford might actually be a robot, and it, we do have 
in, certainly in written science fiction, we have a lot of playing with the idea of uh, the crossover kind of thing with a human becoming more robot and the robot becoming more human. And in any case, you know, it, in any interpretation of Blade Runner is the issue of what is it to be human and what is it to be a robot? You know, that's, that's the question that's there and that was there in uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was the, um, uh, the book it was based on. You know, what, what does it mean to, to be a human? So um, that's, a, that's a fairly frequent trope in, in science fiction, uh, at least, you know, cyberpunk science fiction. Yeah. I'm just wondering to what extent as well that um, films and other type of media have influenced the sound of our technology. I really don't know so much myself about the development of you know, robot or computer languages, but, you know, you go back in time and everything was like this. And did that voice originate <laughs> from film or television and then that became what it was? Or was it actually like that when people couldn't program voices to sound more like you hear on, like, more recent versions of Star Trek? Or, hell, oh, thank you, sir. Like, how is the sound of... Information well, I, I do. I think that what that what generally happens, if I can try to make a generalization, is that something comes out of a lab, and you know, it's in a it, it has a particular form to it, and someone making a film copies that, and the first film that gets a large audience that has is doing one or another of a version of this, everyone else copies that set of sounds. And then it kind of gets implanted in, in our heads. Well, implanted not like an implant, but uh, it, it enters our heads as associating that type of sound with this. And then filmmaker, well, particularly Hollywood films, are afraid to kind of break with what an audience expects. And so, uh, unless they're purposely breaking for a particular effect, they're not going to break with the type of sound that you're used to unless they're really, really trying to make a point of that. Um, so, so it just kind of sticks around for a lot longer than it should. I have a, I have a clip from probably can't find it here now because of the way they've got my computer set up. Um, I, have, I actually have a clip from Star Trek of the computer going, <laughs> you know, the, the, the little weird looking tiny computer with all of its lights flashing and it making these sounds that were thought of as the sounds that a computer makes at you know, in the uh, 1960s, <laughs> a mainframe computer. I, I would, um, anecdotally, I mean, no scientific evidence whatsoever, but because <laughs> I was just, you know, you call like American Airlines Advantage Desk, and, you know, if you're a user, they say, hello, Marianne, <laughs> and you, you know, because you've already registered, so they know your name. But I would argue that the artificiality of it is deliberate because they want you to know you're not speaking to a human. Um, I mean, because it's, you know, it's a human voice, but it definitely has a very artificialness to it. And I think that even, you know, Siri is a little bit like that. Like, there is a distinction between a natural yeah. human voice and what they've programmed as a human computer voice. Well, Again, it, this is my own it, well, thinking about it. I am certain that a company like American Airlines has a crew of public relations specialists that sit around, that probably sat around for a week trying to decide, should we make it sound more human or should we make it sound less human? Because, and they probably go through that exercise once a year where they come out with, you know, they have some kind of new technique that sounds more human-like. Well, should we now go, go over to this, 
but you know, I think that their I think you're right. Their decision it would always be to go to one end or the other, not to be in the middle. You know, to either make it sound enough like it's not human, or to make it sound like really close to human. They wouldn't want something in between. Um, but you know, speaking of things like this. Uh, it's kind of interesting that in the early days of corporate voicemail, the one woman recorded almost all of the early voicemail messages. Um, uh, she, she was first hired by uh, you know one of the Bell companies for you know to 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 have the regular phone message about you know. Uh, operator waiting or whatever uh, and then she every company that started with corporate voicemail hired her to do this I mean, it's a kind of a really interesting story that she because everyone wanted the same voice so. any other questions other? thank you okay thanks <laughs>